All right, they're just all coming on. <laughs> nice. This is a, a big crowd. That's oh. good. You know, Zico, uh, I'm half Brazilian. Oh, uh, fantastic. And, yeah. and so I don't know, but like, you know, Zico, when I was a kid, Zico was number 10 on the Brazil team yeah. and he was like my favorite player. He played I for was, Flamengo, was like a superstar of the 70s, right? I mean, I was, I was so, so I, I'm named after him. So, oh, so. you are? Okay. I was, I was like, going to wonder because it's such a, it's such an uncommon name, but yeah. so as soon as I saw your name, Zico, okay, that's, are you, <laughs> you have any Brazilian in you? Are you? No, uh, my dad's Guatemalan. Uh, okay. And, uh, but he was a big fan of Zico. I was, so I was born in 83 and, uh, you know, so right after the, the 82 World Cup, where All Zico right. tragically missed the penalty kick, right? <laughs> um, and, uh, but, but, you know, still, still a big fan. So, so I was named after him. Yeah. All right. Well, good luck with the talk. Thanks. Okay. Let's uh, probably good to start, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Welcome everyone to, uh, the latest episode of, uh, our seminar on machine learning for uh, uh, engineering and sciences. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Zico Coulter. Um, Zico is an associate professor in the computer science department at Carnegie Mellon University, and also serves as the chief scientist of AI research for the Bosch Center for, for Artificial Intelligence. His work spans the intersection of machine learning and optimization with a large focus on developing more robust and rigor rigorous methods in deep learning. In addition, he has worked in a number of application areas highlighted by work on sustainability and smart energy systems. He is a recipient of the DARPA Young Faculty Award, a Sloan Fellowship, and Best Paper Award at NeurIPS, ICML, IGCIA, KDD, and PESGM. And uh, without any further ado, the, the Zoom call is, is, is yours. Great. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. It's really wonderful to be here. Um, I want to mention a few things before, before we get started. So, so um, during the, during, I, I get good at this by teaching courses. So during the lecture, feel free to, um, to type any chats, any questions in the chat box, uh, or, or even use the raise hand function uh, in, in Zoom. Um, I believe everyone can, can uh, yeah, I think everyone can type in the chat box. Uh, so I, I'd much prefer this to be an interactive uh, session than it, for it to be, um, you know, for me to get through all my slides. So if I miss a few at the end, that's perfectly fine. Um, I'd rather, I'd much rather, as I say, uh, have this be interactive. So please do ask questions as we go through. I'm happy to take the pause and, uh, and answer as we go. So I'm gonna to talk today about uh, incorporating physics and decision-making into deep models using implicit layers. Um, this is joint work really with uh, a large number of my students. Um, I especially wanna highlight Priya Donti, uh, Brandon Amos, Poe Wei, and uh, Philip, who are sort of actually the, the leads in a lot of this work. Uh, as well as many other collaborators we've had sort of along the way. All right, so to start things off, before I get started kind of in the technical dive, I, I kind of want to talk about at a high level what machine learning is right now, or at least what we think of as machine learning models and what we kind of wish we could do, what more we wish we could do with machine learning models. So the way I sort of view uh, machine learning systems uh, in many cases is basically, you know, uh, deep models at least these days, they typically work by having some input data, um, having a bunch of layers, or really just generic functions these things pass through to produce some output um, after going through all these layers. Then we have some loss function here. By the way, can everyone see my, my, uh, my cursor? If I, let me just give me a thumbs up or a yes. yes in the chat box. Yes, you can see my cursor, okay, perfect. Um, so, they, so the input data goes through a bunch of layers, right? Um, these are you know, convolutions, linear layers, uh, any other elements of, of, of deep networks, or they could just be a, you know, a simple linear function, right? We, we like those two, maybe after some nonlinear transforms to features. Um, produces some output. This is sort of the prediction that we get from our, from our uh, algorithm. And then we compute some loss on this output, right? So we compute typically something like for classification, we compute you know, across entropy loss, or for regression, we'll compute like a squared loss and things like this. And this is sort of a, at least a cartoon of how the architecture, not, not the training process, but the architecture of most deep learning systems are uh, work. And then when you think about sort of what it takes to, to learn these models, what it takes to tune them, uh, what, what it really requires is feeding back, uh, computing gradients of this loss function with respect to the parameters of all these layers and somehow updating these parameters to sort of make these, these, these predictions better according to the loss function. 
And this is all, this is, I mean, this has been fantastically successful, right? As a, as a paradigm for how you, how you fit data. And I should clearly find this is, this is really about supervised learning here, um, not machine learning in general, but this is um, about supervised learning. But the reality is this doesn't capture, this misses a lot of things that we would like to have uh, in machine learning systems. So we would like to, for instance, be able to specify some sort of sort of structural specifications on the input. So maybe the input only is going to come from a certain domain and we have no certain balance in the input. And we'd like to somehow capture that better in the, in the model itself or make the model aware that we're going to get data from a certain, from a certain uh, structure. Um, we may also want to embed things like, uh, like constraints into the, um, into the network itself. So maybe we want to, uh, if we're if the network's trying to approximate, say, some physical process, like we're trying to, you know, approximate some simulation, um, we probably want to actually obey the laws of physics when it comes to the actual structure of the network, right? We, the, to a first approximation, at least know a lot of laws of physics, and it seems kind of crazy to make the networks, these networks we train, relearn everything from scratch in some sense, right? Why don't we just sort of enforce these things directly within the networks? And then finally, um, while we often train these networks for some sort of simple loss, like as I said, sort of a cross entropy loss, or you can really think of it as sort of just minimizing the error in predictions with respect to some ground truth. The reality is when we embed these machine learning systems inside larger processes, like decision-making processes, um, we get much more complex systems that where the, the real loss in some sense that we're trying to optimize is some downstream result of our decision-making process for which this predictive model is one component. And we really would like to, if possible, try to optimize performance of the entire system, not just a single kind of machine learning component there. Okay. So I want to start off by giving, you know, this is a little bit abstract here. I want to give kind of one concrete example of this as well. An illustrative, an illustrative example, um, which actually will 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 uh, both give sort of sort of in the abstract and in the concrete setting. Um, <laughs> I've noticed that every time someone enters the waiting room, it takes over my screen. So I have to click back. Is it, you know, if there's a way to like disable the waiting room so you can just get in automatically. I'll, I'll just keep clicking. If I, if I can't go forward a few times, it'll be all right. Um, OK, so, so here's a common illustration uh, that I think is actually a very common sort of mode for a lot of machine learning systems. Um, and I'm actually going to give you a, a concrete example in the setting of, of power systems in a second. So we have some input data. Um, we feed this input data into a machine learning system. Uh, the input data, of course, is very structured itself. It has certain constraints on it, but typically the machine learning system, you know, might not know about that. And we make some prediction about what's going to happen in the future. Um, and uh, then we feed this sort of prediction into maybe a decision-making pr process, uh, like trying to you know, base some decisions based upon this prediction. And we finally get some sort of cost, not a loss in terms of like the accuracy of the prediction, but an actual cost in terms of the domain that we care about. So an example would be in the context of something like power systems. Um, maybe we want to predict, we want to determine how to schedule you know, the, the, the power grid for the upcoming day. In this case, we would take in input data like weather data. We would use this weather data, or maybe, I don't know, the, the day of the week, the hour of the day, et cetera. Right? We use all, this, use all this data to forecast upcoming electrical demand. And then we would use this to solve an optimal power dispatch problem, right? With some sort of convex or non-convex optimization technique. And then the final cost you really care about would be something like either monetary cost or maybe the CO2 emissions of our final dispatch and things like this, right? Now, if you think about how traditional machine learning is applied here, the way it typically works is that you tune your forecasting uh, process kind of separate from the rest of the system here, right? So you sort of, you have some ground truth about what the actual say electrical demand was on past days and you tune your system just to improve performance of that one component, right? So you try to minimize you know, the squared error of that, of that component. But the reality is when we think about machine learning systems kind of in these holistic processes, um, there's a lot more structure that's involved here. Right, so there's you know there's this decision making procedure here uh, based upon power flow, which actually is a very sort of um, you know, structured process that really has a lot of structure to it. It's not it's really the solution optimization problem. There may be our physical constraints that are that they're sort of uh, enforced by the the nature of the weather and things like this. 
And what we would really like to do is in some sense, optimize this whole process in an end-to-end -end fashion, such that this one component of the machine learning model is optimized not to just sort of improve its own performance in a sort of a least square sense, but to improve the entire performance of the whole system to say, minimize CO2 emissions and things like this. And this is sort of one illustration of the things you kind of want to do in machine learning and the things which they at least currently are not very well, um, not very well tuned for doing, not very well able to do. So what this talk is gonna be about, it's gonna be about a set of techniques that get at addressing some of these problems in machine learning. And the tool that we're going to use to address these things, which actually is it's a very general tool here, is the tool of what we call implicit layers. So um, to kick off the rest of the talk then, uh, there's really two sections to this talk. In the first section, I'm gonna talk about what implicit layers in deep learning are. Um, actually, my group does a lot of work in implicit layers in many different contexts, but I'm gonna sort of introduce them in one context here um, and describe what these things mean at a high level, as well as describe some of, the, some of the math and formalisms about how we actually integrate these things into modern machine learning systems. Um, then I'll talk about a number of applications for these implicit layers in machine learning. And we'll just uh, have a few final thoughts at the very end. All right, so uh, any questions so far? There's none, none appearing in the chat so far, but I'll, I'll, uh, I'll pause a second here in case there are any questions. So if not, but if not, I'll uh, happy, to, happy to just jump right in. All right, so let's talk about implicit layers in deep learning. So to start off with talking about implicit layers, I wanna talk about what I mean by a layer. Okay, so, so this is actually um, now getting somewhat into the weeds of, of modern machine learning, but hopefully anyone that sort of has done some amount of machine learning or play with machine learning, uh, even, even in an applied sense with tools like um, deep learning tools like PyTorch or TensorFlow, you probably have a pretty good intuitive sense of these things already. So hopefully this is just sort of codifies um, a lot of what you, a lot of what you sort of already know about modern machine learning. So, the way the, 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 the way one typically thinks about what we call a layer in the machine learning system is as some sort of simple operation, like a matrix multiplication, a convolution, a ReLU, et cetera. And the way we build kind of modern deep networks, uh, it's sort of you know, broadly speaking in, in the domain of, of deep learning, is that we compose a number of these layers together and we optimize the entire system in an end-to-end -end fashion. And this is sort of how typical machine learning systems work right now. So this is, this, this is sort of, you know, a, a standard sort of method for, for uh, building uh, machine learning systems. But this actually kind of, uh, in some sense, oversimplifies uh, or, or, or the, the, the common usage of layers actually is, is, is simpler than it has to be. So people typically think of layers as being very, very simple things. But the reality is that layers can actually be much more complex computational units. So rather than thinking of a layer uh, in a deep learning system just as you know, a matrix multiply or a convolution or things like this, it acts as the case that much more complex computations can also be directly embedded into deep learning systems as layers. And so the, as some examples of layers that we can actually integrate into you know, modern machine learning systems, these could include things like layers that solve optimization problems or layers that compute the solution to fixed point iterations, layers that simulate things like differential equations or even partial or ordinary differential equations or even partial differential equations. These are all also computational units that we can embed as layers in a deep network, but doing so requires that we actually introduce a more general notion of a layer than is typically done, which is the notion of an implicit layer. So just to, to give some context here, the way we typically think about a layer in a deep network is that it is some explicit function that computes the output of the layer, which I'm calling here Y, as some function of the input to the layer X. And so if your layer is a convolution, you will take the input, which is some image, I guess it could be a, a multi-channel uh, image, right? Uh, it applies some operation to this image. And then what you get out is a new uh, different, you know, a new image of a possibly different size, a different number of channels, et cetera. Okay. And that's what a convolution is. And it's, a, it's sort of a, a um, it is a procedural way to compute the output from the input. 
But there's actually there's another type of layer we can think about in deep learning, which I'm calling an implicit layer. And an implicit layer is a layer that doesn't specify necessarily, or doesn't require you to specify precisely how you compute the solution from the, uh, of, of the output from the input. Rather, given an input, what an implicit layer does is it finds some output y such that the input and output jointly satisfy some equation here, some possibly nonlinear equation. This equation could be, you know, by, by making this equation different forms, you can solve different things like optimization problems. Optimization problems can be characterized as, as the solution to nonlinear equations. Um, similarly, uh, if, if, if you sort of extend your notion from algebraic equations to differential equations, you can also solve things like ODEs or PDEs using this form of an implicit layer. Now, of course, to actually use these things uh, in, in a network, you have to know how to you know, find that solution, right? You have to be able to, to find the solution. But what I'm, what I'm actually going to argue here is that this level of abstraction is very useful in understanding how we can construct layers and embed more complicated processes into machine learning systems. Right. Um, yeah, so someone asked me to explain what a convolution means. Uh, let's, don't, don't worry about that. Convolution is a very sort of common layer to use in, in machine learning systems. You can think about a layer as just like a, um, a, 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 a matrix, matrix multiplier, something like that. And, and really that's, um, in some sense, this is actually not, doesn't really matter. But the point is that modern deep learning systems do use sort of a combination of these very simple operations composed together to produce the ultimate output of the network from its input. All right, so hopefully that, uh, that okay, great. Yeah, the, what a convolution is actually doesn't really matter here. It's a, it's a you know, image processing kind of thing, but, but it's, all, all that really matters is it's used very heavily in modern deep learning. But the point I wanna highlight here is really this, this, this different notion of what a layer is. You can think of a layer as sort of a root finding system rather than an explicit compute block. And that's really the key idea here. So what does it take to integrate a deep, uh, a sort of an implicit layer into a, a modern deep learning system? Well, the way, and I, maybe I'll go back to this sort of uh, figure for a second, just for jump, jumping around here a bit, maybe, maybe inadvisably, but the way modern deep learning systems work is they have some input, they feed the input through a, a whole sequence of, of these layers. And then they have to compute the gradient, the, the, the way to adjust the parameters of these layers with respect to some criterion you're trying to optimize, like the loss here. And so the, what's needed in order to integrate, have one of these layers not be a precise computation, but actually an implicit function is two things. So first of all, we need to be able to compute what I'm calling the forward pass. And I should say, I'm gonna give some more concrete examples of these. This is a little bit abstract right now, I know, but hopefully you'll sort of see, you'll see, you'll see this and you'll see some sort of concrete examples later and this whole thing as a whole can kind of start to, start to make some sense. So there's really two things that are needed to integrate a layer like this uh, into a deep network. And those things are uh, what we call the forward pass and the backward pass of the system, of, of, of the layer. So in the forward pass, what we mean, I, you may have heard these terms before if you've heard people in machine learning kind of talk about, about the, the sort of the, um, sort of the structure of machine learning algorithms. Um, what this means is in the forward pass, you actually compute kind of the output of your network given some input. So you're given some input X, like I would, you know, in, in the example of uh, power forecasting, the X would be the weather. Uh, this passes through a bunch of these layers and what you get out is a prediction of future, of future electric, electrical demand. Now to integrate a, a, a unit in that network that is an implicit layer, we of course need to find some way of computing what this output is uh, given, given the input here uh, with, with, with a sort of single layers output is. Of course, you would compose many of these together potentially to form your whole network, but just for the single layer here, we need some way of computing the output uh, as a function of the input here. Now, um, the nice thing about this, and, and, and you know, when uh, this is, so, so, so for explicit layers, the sort of the, the layer itself specifies kind of how to compute its output, right? Sort of a, a common function. But for implicit layers, all we're saying here is that they, they, they need to sort of jointly satisfy some nonlinear equation. And therefore it can be hard to know how to actually solve this equation here. And so what we're going to do though, 
is that we are going to, um, uh, yeah, so someone asked, uh, so maybe I'll, I'll get to the question in a second, actually. So what we're going to do in, in, in sort of a, a the forward pass is we're just going to find a y that satisfies this equation. And this is actually a very sort of abstract thing, but the good news here is that if your layer represents kind of anything we've talked about before, like an optimization solver, like a PDE solver, like an ODE solver, then computing the forward pass just typically means, you know, solving that optimization problem or solving that ODE or PDE. And there's a whole wide range of existing solvers that can be used for this. We don't need to implement our own. We can just rely on existing techniques for solving this forward pass. Now, do remember though, what I'm talking about here is to integrate the structure into a network, you need to actually um, solve this thing at every iteration of the forward pass. So we're talking about things that can be, you know, slower than typical deep networks, but this is, is what I'm advocating for. I'm advocating for sort of, you know, solving an optimization problem every time you want to make a prediction. Um, there's a question is, so the definition of, what, what is the definition of a layer? Yeah, so I'm, I'm trying to be a little bit abstract here. A definite, a, the layer that I typically, the way I typically define layer is that a layer is a differentiable parametric function. Um, and all I will say here is that yes, it can be defined either explicitly in terms of the direct, direct compute you'd use to map inputs to outputs, or it can be defined implicitly. Um, uh, and it really is the implicit function theorem that is that is what's, what's making this, um, uh, what actually makes this thing differentiable. But I'll get more to that in a second, actually. Does that answer your question, Andrea? Okay, so I'll, unless you have a follow-up, I'll, 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 I'll keep going. Okay, so, so the, in some sense, there's this first thing you need, which is just built to, to solve this implicit function um, when you, or to compute the output of this implicit function when you want to, when you want to embed a layer like this. Um, the second thing you need to integrate when you have a when, when, when you want to uh, use one of these implicit functions as a layer in a deep network is to be able to compute what we call the backward pass uh, through the network too. And what this involves is this involves computing the Jacobian of the output of this layer with respect to the input. Now, actually, technically speaking, it's also with respect to any parameters this network has, which I'll call theta here, but that's sort of a detail you don't really need to worry about. And even more formally, actually, um, in for those, so so if this bit doesn't make sense, please please don't worry about it. But for those, uh, and by the way, what, what, what I mean by the Jacobian here is you have to compute the derivatives of every term of the output with respect to every term of the input. Um, and the reason why you need this is that this procedure of computing gradients, of computing derivatives, is exactly how we train our deep networks. And so to incorporate one of these uh, implicit layers into a deep network, you need to be able to differentiate through this, this implicit layer. Yeah. And so this is why you need to be able to do this. Uh, for those that sort of know this, um, technically speaking, actually, it's not, we don't have to compute the full Jacobian. That would be very slow and you know, memory intensive and time consuming because these are very big layers potentially. What well, we actually have to be able to compute is something called the vector Jacobian product, which is essentially the, the, the tool you need to actually do um, what's called reverse mode automatic differentiation. Again, the details here aren't important, but, but just know that for those that are interested, um, we don't actually compute the full Jacobian. We're actually just computing products with the Jacobian and things like that. Okay, so these are the two parts that we need. Now, the forward pass is kind of already taken care of. Um, the forward pass is just basically given a, uh, you know, a layer defined this way, given a differential equation, given optimization procedure. Uh, we want to be able to solve that thing. We can do that with existing solvers. But the backward pass is a little bit more complicated. Most existing solvers don't actually you know, provide gradients or derivatives through a, a you know, PDE uh, uh, PDE simulation or an optimization uh, solution. So it turns out here we have to be a little bit more careful, um, but but fortunately things aren't too bad. And this next slide is going to have you know more math than the rest of the talk. So this is really just for people that are curious how we're doing this. Um, I suspect actually the question already one of the the, the the latest question here actually is sort of hinted that they already know. Some people might already know this. So um, this might be a, <laughs> a a wide range here and in in, in in the video or in the in the in the seminar, but um, this is this is really going to be just sort of the, the, the details of how we compute this backward pass. So, the the way the thing we're trying to do um, in this in this in this backward pass is we're trying to compute what I'm calling here the Jacobian of y with respect to x, and that basically means we have to compute every derivative of every out, uh, element of the output with respect to every element of the input. 
And this is like a hard thing because, you know, how do you differentiate through, say, a PDE solve or how do you differentiate through a, an optimization procedure? But it turns out actually, this is actually, this, this is not that difficult. This has been known for a very long time how to do this. And it goes by a lot of different names, a lot of different fields. So if you're used to uh, ODEs, you may know this as the adjoint method. Uh, if you're used to sort of more, uh, you yeah, know, functional um, or, or sort of more mathematical uh, the notation, you might just call it implicit differentiation. Uh, but there's actually been a technique for doing this kind of thing for a very, very long time. So I'm, I'm gonna kind of actually run through this, the simplest case of this, just to sort of show in some detail how we compute um, derivatives through implicit layers like this, because this really is the, the key property we need to integrate them into modern machine learning and deep learning architectures. Okay, so to start off with, we're gonna start off with, with this condition, which we have for the, and as I said, if this little bit of math doesn't, if, if you don't follow here, please don't worry. Um, it's not important for the vast majority of what follows, but for those that sort of understand it, it might be interesting about how we actually do this in practice. Okay, so to start off with, we're going to start with writing down our solution that we found uh, to our implicit function, right? And I'm going to write it in a little bit different way here. I'm going to write y as a function of x because remember, x is the input to this layer. So x sets up say, the initial conditions of the PDE. It sets up the optimization variables and or, or, or the, the the data of the optimization problem. It is what we input to this network, and then the solution we get out is is y. And so, of course, y here depends on x. It's the whole point, right? Is, you know, if we give it different input to this optimization problem, different PDE solver, we would get a different solution out. Um, but whatever the solution is, it's going to be a function of our input, but it's also going to satisfy this equation here, right? So we know it satisfies this equation. And so that uh, sort of element we have. Now, all we do is we just differentiate both sides of this equation with respect to x. So we're just going to take uh, derivatives here with respect to both. Uh, these are all multivariate derivatives, but it doesn't really matter. Um, we, just, we just take derivatives on both sides. Of course, 0 is just constant, so it still remains 0. And what we have on the left-hand side here is just the derivative of this thing with respect to x. And technically, actually, this step relies on the existence of these derivatives, which is implied by something called the implicit function theorem, which, which is uh, you know, a sort of a standard result in, in, um, in calculus. But I'm going to sort of assume that, that we, this thing does exist, and, and then therefore we can take derivatives, and everything kind of works out well. OK, so now this, this is sort of the first simple step. Now we have the one kind of complex step here where we have to differentiate this thing with respect to x. Um, but really, this is just sort of you know, a function of two variables, where this, where this one here is further a function of, 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 the, of the input. And so all we're going to do here is we're going to apply the chain rule um, uh, to, to differentiate this thing with respect to x. And what that gives us is this thing. So basically, you first differentiate um, this thing here with respect to its first argument, which is just x. And what I'm writing here, when I write just y by itself, what I mean by that is now I'm treating y as kind of a fixed solution rather than an actual function of x. So this is just sort of you know at the solution this this procedure this, this uh, value holds here. And similarly, this so this would be the the derivative of or the the Jacobian of this function with respect to x, just evaluated at the solution uh, x and y. And similarly, this thing here would be the, the Jacobian of G with respect to Y evaluated at that solution. Okay, and all I've done here is I've just expanded out this derivative using the chain rule. It's 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 you know the not quite the simplest expression you can do in calculus, but one of the simplest ones you can do. Um, the point though is that now we have a very nice equation here because these first two terms, those are just sort of ordinary normal derivatives that we have um, from from sort of you know, ordinary. Uh, ordinary calculus, those are just known functions. G is a known function. Y here is just being treated as the actual, you know, what the solution is. And therefore we can compute both these uh, Jacobians with using techniques from automatic differentiation. So um, just to be clear what that means, um, in most deep learning, we don't work out our gradients manually. We actually just use tools like PyTorch and TensorFlow, which themselves use a technique called automatic differentiation to sort of compute these gradients. Um, and so basically, if you can define a function kind of in terms of norm, uh, you know, without implicit functions, it's in terms of normal explicit functions, you can always just get these, gra these gradients or these, these Jacobians however you want. Um, they'll, they'll just be, you know, the software can form them automatically. But now it's nice because now we have sort of a set of equations here where we know these two things and what we're trying to figure out is this one here. 
And so all we do is we just rearrange this thing and do a linear solve to find what this actual Jacobian here is, which is what we're after. It's you know, the Jacobian of how Y uh, responds with changes in X. And the key point to all of this is that these two things here, these are just matrices. Um, and so, or matrices or vectors really depending on, on the, the size of your, of your inputs, but these are basically just matrices here. And um, what this means is that it, we can actually compute this thing that we want to know, this, this Jacobi we want to know by just doing a single linear solve, right? We do a single linear solve, which involves a matrix inverse. In practice, we don't actually invert that directly. We solve it with an indirect method. But again, that's sort of the details there. Um, and then now we have kind of the, the derivative we actually want. Okay. So this is actually all I'm going to say about it. Um, I'll give some resources on the next slide about learning about this, this stuff more. But the big point that I want to make here is that even for relatively complex uh, operations like solving a optimization problem or solving a PDE, we can actually incorporate those blocks, those sort of computational blocks into directly into a deep network to make the deep network sort of enforce that structure within its own architecture. And then we can use this technique of implicit differentiation to, uh, to actually provide, to actually allow that block to be a differentiable function that we can you know, incorporate within existing, within existing um, toolkits like deep learning toolkits like PyTorch or TensorFlow or these sorts of things. So that's the, that's the basic idea there. Um, and then again, this, this is called implicit differentiation. It goes back uh, decades, if not, you know, I guess in the automatic differentiation case has gone back decades in the, in the generic mathematical sense has gone back centuries. But this is, this is what we're using to sort of incorporate these implicit layers into deep learning. And I'm gonna you know, have a, a lot more applications in a second. Okay, so before I go on, um, if, if some of this seemed a bit quick and, and it was fairly quick here, and I, I think I sort of did you know, assume a lot of these basic background knowledge about machine learning and deep learning for this to really kind of make sense. But what I will say is if you want more information uh, on, explicit, on explicit layers, um, some colleagues and I actually gave a tutorial uh, on this exact topic uh, at the past uh, NeurIPS conference that happened this past December, so la uh, last month. And um, not only, you know, we, we gave it there, but the thing I actually want to highlight is that if you um, go to implicitlayerstutorial.org, there's a website with a lot more information, so very detailed notes, um, uh, notes that, by the way, are all runnable in Google Colab, so you can actually launch all those things in Google Colab and run the code that we run there, um, as well as the full video and slides of our tutorial. So you can both kind of, you know, view some detailed notes about these things, including not just sort of implicit functions in general, but also things like uh, ordinary differential equations, differential optimization, and other things that this has sort of been applied to. Okay. So I, I would, if for those interested in digging deeper into this topic, it's a really actually um, topic we sort of work in a lot, has a ton of applications beyond what I'm going to talk about today. And I'd highly recommend you, you check out sort of this, 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 these resources here as a, as a deeper dive into it. But the point that I do want to highlight um, is that, you know, this, this seems complicated and it seems like, okay, you know, how, how do I actually go from this math here to a real layer that say solves an optimization problem? That seems hard, uh, but it turns out that in, uh, you know, in the context of, of sort of uh, modern toolkits for these things, so, so modern optimization toolkits as well as modern toolkits for things like deep learning, you can actually do these things in remarkably little code. So um, on this next slide, this is not intended to be read by the way, but on this next slide, I have the complete code for a differentiable generic uh, convex optimization solver written in the PyTorch library. So PyTorch is a very common library for deep learning. It is a diff an automatic differentiation library. So it will provide you kind of gradients to construct your model and then train it. Um, and this code here is the key, complete code, not, not partial, but the complete code for uh, solving generic convex optimization and then differentiating through that using um, PyTorch. And we actually use, um, uh, just to highlight the fact that the, you know, these things can be solved with kind of off the shelf solvers, we actually use um, a, a solver called CVXPy to solve these things. This is a generic convex optimization library uh, written by, by folks out of Stanford. We actually, um, we actually just use that to do the forward pass. And then this code here basically does the, does the backward pass of the, of the implicit layer. 
And, and it really is not that much code. I mean, when it comes down to it, you know, it's a 60 lines or so of Python code. Uh, you probably probably don't want to use this one, actually. It's not quite as stress tested as, as others. But as, as, as an illustration, it's, it's really amazing how quickly you can embed these very complex processes as layers in deep networks. Um, and when I say here, this is sort of generic, it means it can solve really any complex optimization problem with inequality and equality constraints. Um, so this is, this is a very sort of generic piece of code here. Okay, so with that all being said, um, that's some sort of the technical background, uh, but again, and, and hopefully at least uh, the, if some of the details were a bit vague here, the high level here made sense, which is that we want to take machine learning systems and inject very structured layers, very structured constraints into these things in order to more faithfully kind of model the real phenomena that we see. So whether the real phenomena be sort of decision-making processes that go on after the fact, whether they be things like um, simulations or, or uh, uh, physical constraints the system has to obey, this is what we're ultimately doing with these networks here. And so I want to spend the rest of the talk now talking about what we can do with these things, because we can do a lot with these sorts of layers. And I want to talk a little bit about some applications of what we can, in fact, do with them. Um, so someone asked, how does Pi CVX scale? Uh, my experience with the MATLAB CVX is it only works for smaller problems. Uh, I mean, so I think this is more a question of, of, uh, of, of CVX Pi, right, and, and, and its scalability. So as with all things, you know, small, small, um, uh, gen there's a trade-off between the level of, of um, how generic something is and how scalable it is. But what I will say is that CVX Pi can handle easily problems with hundreds of thousands of variables. Um, to be honest, the, the 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 bigger bottleneck here is that when we're talking about solving them in the uh, within a layer in a deep learning system, we are really talking about solving a optimization problem with CVX Pi every single time we make a prediction with our machine learning you know model. And so you typically are already dealing with relatively smaller scale uh, models because this isn't like you formulate one big problem and let it solve overnight. This is like literally every time you want to, you know, get a gradient for any single example in your training set or in your test set, you have to solve an optimization problem. So we're kind of out of necessity talking about smaller scale problems here for which CVX Pi usually works just fine. And it does far scale that kind of stuff well. It's actually, it's relatively scalable. Um, I, 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 and, I think both it and CBX actually work pretty well for a lot of realistic problems. Okay, so let's talk about what we can do with this. Um, and I'm going to go quickly here because because really this is sort of going to be kind of a you know a a uh, a laundry list of a few of the papers that we've written about these kind of things. And I and I don't want to really go into the details of any single example here. What I want to do is try to give an overall impression of the scope of applications you can solve that are typically actually very hard for traditional machine learning that when you inject these implicit layers into models, you can solve much more, much more um, reliably. All right, so the first one I'm gonna talk about is um, this actually this example I gave right at the beginning of what we call task-based learning. So the example here is that, you know, we have our, our normal machine learning kind of pipeline. This is the, the weather prediction, or sorry, uh, you know, weather data, electricity consumption prediction, optimal power dispatch, and then you know, minimization of some final cost. And what we find is we actually, we actually by, by making not just this part kind of our, our differential model, but by actually making the whole chain here uh, differentiable. And we can do that because the decision-making process is actually an optimization problem. Um, and now we know how to differentiate the optimization problems by, by our sort of implicit differentiation method. And so what we can actually do is train our system, uh, you know, including our machine learning model, in a fully end-to-end -end fashion where we actually train it not just to minimize, you know, predictive loss on our data set, but we actually train our machine learning model to minimize the cost of, in say, carbon emissions of our forecasting model when it is plugged into a decision-making procedure. And I think it's actually a very powerful paradigm, right? Is that you know very often times we apply machine learning systems, um, not we we apply them in an end-to-end -end system where the true objective is very different from the objective that we trained the model on. We usually train it on something very simple, like you know predictive law, predictive you know squared error and things like that. But with these techniques, you can actually train them in a fully kind of end-to-end -end fashion. 
And so what we're showing here is that um, the, the, these plots here, and actually don't worry about these, these, these ones below are, are training losses. They don't they aren't really important. What's important to note are these two, the, the red and the, and the, and the um, and the uh, red, the red and the green lines here. The green line is our sort of fully end-to-end -end system. The red line is just training this uh, machine learning model based upon root mean squared error alone. And what we see is that uh, if you measure sort of the performance of, of a, uh, and, and this is actually applied to, as I said, an, an electricity dispatch problem where we are forecasting future energy and then using that to schedule, um, do it basically a uh, power dispatch in the grid. And what we find is, if you train the model using you know, sort of typical techniques like minimizing squared error, then the actual performance of the two models isn't that different. So it does a it's a little bit better in terms of root mean squared error to actually train the, mo the model in terms of root mean squared error. Um, and that, that's not surprising, but they're actually quite close. You, you don't gain a lot by sort of, uh, uh, you know, um, focusing just on squared error in your predictions. However, on the flip side, what we see is that if you look at, and, and here the, the x-axis here is the hour of the day ahead that we're forecasting. Um, what we find is that um, the loss, the actual say CO2 emissions cost of a model that just tries to minimize root mean squared error is far, far higher than a model that tries to actually minimize the actual you know, end task of this network which is something like minimize CO2 emissions or minimize just the cost of generation. And so oftentimes, you know, we, we can get predictions that are nearly as good as kind of standard training, but a 50% here reduction in cost when it's actually used as part of a full end-to-end -end system. And this sort of notion of training things based upon their eventual loss is I think a very powerful one that, that has a lot of applications in, in different aspects of machine learning. Yeah, exactly. So someone asks, so someone asks is, you know, so in a way the, the decision making itself is being incorporated as a layer. Exactly right. So that's, you know, what we're doing here is we're taking the decision making procedure, which is an optimization solver. It's, it's doing power dispatch. And we are making that a differentiable optimization solver and treating this whole thing here as the network instead of just the sort of the traditional way of just treating the network as a, as a, uh, you know, as a self-contained kind of prediction. All right, um, oops. Uh, another example here. Actually, is this gonna play? Oh, it's not, oh, well, it's not playing. Um, uh, that's too bad. Um, so another example, I think it's on my end. I think I don't, it's not playing here either, so. Another example of this is actually incorporating not just decision making but also physics into the into the um, into the network. So physics itself actually involves a solution of a nonlinear set of equations, right? So um, for example, rigid body simulation in uh, we, uh, set up as say, a linear complementarity problem. Again, the details here, if you're not familiar with that, th this doesn't really matter here. But this is this is one way one way to solve one, one way to compute equations of motion for bodies under um, basically under, you know, a, a rigid body constraints. So, you know, joint constraints and things like uh, collision constraints and friction is through a set of nonlinear equations called a linear complementarity problem, which sort of embed, you know, the laws of motion and friction and, and uh, constraints, this kind of thing. And those though are just a bunch of nonlinear uh, equations. And so by building sort of a differentiable simulator, uh, a differentiable version of these of these simulation equations, we can actually integrate a rigid body dynamics, a rigid body simulator itself as a layer in deep networks. And um, what we did with this approach is we used this layer to uh, play games uh, like, like breakout here that you, you see in, um, in this figure here. So breakout's a game where you, you, know, you move a paddle on the bottom to balance this ball to hit these bricks here. And when it comes down to it, breakout is actually a nice example here because it really is a physics game, right? So breakout is a game about physics and you can model exactly what's going on here with physics, right? You just, it's, a, it's a ball bouncing and you know, colliding with objects. There's, there's not even any friction here. It's just, just collisions. Um, and you know, perfectly elastic ones at that, right? There's, there's, there's no drag or anything even. So uh, it's really simple physics actually. Um, but the advantage of doing this when, when you want to learn a game like this is actually very, very stark here in some cases. So what we show here um, is we show that uh, as you, so, so, so uh, what I'm showing in this figure below is the performance that our method achieves as a function of the number of samples it observes. So with traditional methods for sort of solving domains like this based upon some you know, generic 
uh, reinforcement learning algorithms like Q-learning, what we have is that it takes typically a very, very long time. You know, the system does learn. It actually, in the end, is a little bit better because it's not constrained by physics in some sense. But it takes a very, very long time, a lot of uh, steps before you learn really anything about how to play this game. Whereas if you embed a physical simulation inside your, your policy, essentially, how you control this, this, this uh, your, 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 your um, little player in this game, you can learn with you know, orders of magnitude less data, which becomes much more, in some sense, much more human-like because humans can actually do this but also with very little data. We don't need to observe you know, 10 million samples before we can, we can learn how to play breakout. You can learn it quite quickly, right? And so I think actually this captures much more, a much more realistic model of kind of how we play games like Breakout. Um, and also just from a practical standpoint, you can now learn these games with much, much less data than you would need otherwise. Um, okay, so someone asks, um, would it work for non-convex optimization? I have a use case which is exactly like yours, but I need Bayesian optimization because they have function non-convex. So yes, it absolutely does. Um, Bayesian optimization is a little bit hard because in Bayesian optimization, you, you don't know the objective, right? You're trying to fit the objective with a Gaussian process simultaneously while you're trying to optimize it. So it's a little bit trickier, uh, but in general, those conditions I gave, that I gave before actually work perfectly well for not the non-convex case. Uh, I, I'm using, I, I, I gave an example of the convex case really just because um, I have a library I can call, so the forward pass is easier. But actually, that implicit differentiation works just as well for the non-convex case. It just, just gives us a local gradient um, rather than a rather than a globe, rather than you know, you can't find necessarily the global solution to the optimization problem anymore. But you can say that the you know, if you find a solution that is a local optima, you will get a local gradient at that point. Yeah, so it does work. But again, it's a little bit trickier for Bayesian optimization because you have this weird trade-off of, of not actually knowing the real underlying function. So you have to figure out how to do that precisely. It's a little trickier there, though we actually have been doing a little bit of work on that. So I'm happy to sort of ch uh, chat offline about that. Um, but really, it's, it's, it's not solved by any means in, in sp the specific case of Bayesian optimization. Okay, so let's just keep sort of marching forward through a few more. I'm just going to go kind of kind of highlight a few more examples, and then maybe we can we can have some time for questions at the end. Uh, another example we had recently at this past year's uh, ICML is um, uh, a method for incorporating not just not just uh, uh, sort of physics simulation, which is a, which is in that case a, an ordinary differential equation, um, but actually uh, incorporating PDEs into into uh, deep networks. So obviously, I mean, this crowd probably knows the utility of PDEs here uh, pretty well. I don't, I don't need to. Um, go on too much about that, but obviously uh, a lot of settings you, want, you sort of want to solve PEs. Um, and uh, there's a lot of settings where you sort of want to solve them more quickly. And people actually have, been, have applied a lot of work uh, to, to um, in machine learning, sort of learn how to solve PEs more quickly. Um, but oftentimes when you, when you do this, if, if you just try to treat kind of like a PDE simulation as, as sort of a black box and just try to learn a machine learning system that kind of mimics that, you actually do badly in a lot of new situations because, you know, just the, the laws of physics, they can kind of interpolate between existing sort of simulations pretty well, but you can't really generalize the new conditions where there are genuinely new sort of phenomena in physics you have to model well. Um, and so what we show in this work here is that actually if we embed a low resolution PDE solver uh, into what's called a graph neural network. So this is actually a network that operates directly not on the, like, like the, the pixels of, of something like this, but actually on a, on a real mesh because PDE is typically solved over, over complex, over you know, multi-scale meshes. We show that we can actually can, can substantially speed up um, sort of the, the computation of the, uh, of the of, or we can speed up the computation of the, of the um, the PDE substantially. This is uh, an airfoil example that we're talking about here. While still being much faster than the sort of full resolution PDE and much more accurate than a kind of a pure machine learning based approach. And so, I mean, essentially just, you know, th this, this, this is a little, a little cartoon of our architecture here. Details aren't too important, but basically uh, this, this top level here is kind of a traditional um, graph network for predicting uh, maybe how fluid will evolve in a, over a mesh. Um, and what we do is we actually take a much coarser version of this mesh, feed it into a differentiable PDE solver, uh, upsample this and kind of integrate this, the output of this PDE solver into our, um, our simulation. And actually, because this is all differentiable, we can back propagate through the entire thing, including this PDE solver here to make the thing as accurate as possible. Uh, and, and again, differentiation to PDEs is just called the adjoint method. This is actually this is actually very well known, and a lot of solvers already support this. We have to just write the hooks to let it kind of plug into a library like PyTorch. 
Uh, and actually, the, the code for this is actually available too. Though, though, setting up PDE simulation code is is kind of a pain. So, so uh, uh, it's a little bit more heavy duty than the rest, uh, just in terms of the amounts of code you have to have to write to do it. Um, another recent paper we have, actually, this, this paper is coming out this coming up year, and iClear is a paper that um, combines uh, robust optimization and deep reinforcement learning. So, so a, a major challenge in reinforcement learning uh, is that um, during the learning process and during the um, and, and actually during the final execution process too, we typically cannot enforce kind of hard constraints on what the reinforcement learning algorithm wants to do, right? So, you know, in order to explore this, this isn't fully, it might make do some very bad things, and that's fine if you're learning to play, you know, pong or or uh, or even uh, you know a complex game like. Um, and one of these strategy games like uh, StarCraft or stuff like this, which have been essentially solved or very, I shouldn't say solved. They've been, um, they've had sort of excellent performance uh, on these types of games, the complex games with machine, with, with reinforcement learning systems. But the problem is if you want to apply reinforcement learning to a, a really safety critical domain, like a, you know, automatic braking system of a car and things like this, right? This is, you know, despite being a much simpler system in a lot of ways, uh, this really hasn't happened yet because there's no car that's going to, you know, risk crashing a hundred times uh, before it finally figures out that, okay, now I know how to, how to do it. I mean, even frankly, in development, they probably wouldn't do that. Um, and certainly not in sort of in real time, right? You, you wouldn't want to sort of deploy a car, even if it can eventually improve its performance, you, you probably don't want to crash a hundred times before you learn to do anything. <coughs> On the flip side, uh, techniques from robust control are very good at enforcing constraints on, on and safety constraints on kind of classical control laws when, when uh, the system is at least known to within some bounds. And so what we do in some recent work is that we show that we can actually enforce these same robust control constraints within arbitrary deep, deep reinforcement learning policies. And what I mean by that is most robust, most robust uh, control essentially works by specifying some set of all kind of allowable controls that are safe. And this is typically uh, measured by something like a Lyapunov function that, you know, energy is dissipating from the system. If you take a, some sort of, uh, you know, some sort of uh, action, which I'll call U here within this space. And typically a robust control comes up with a very sort of simple, uh, a simple control, like a linear control law that actually predicts what this, what this control should be in order to satisfy these constraints. And what we show is that you actually can take the same sort of constraint manifold here, the same sort of control manifold here, and just take your, you know, arbitrary neural network here and just project it, or the output of an arbitrary neural network, and just project it onto this, con this, this constraint set. And what this actually lets you do is this lets you um, guarantee that at every point of your, of your sort of learning and execution, your deep neural network will satisfy the same uh, constraints, the same robustness constraints as typical robust, as typical robust control, but potentially work much better. And we show that it does in fact work much better on, um, on, uh, uh in, in sort of average cases where things are maybe not worst case. Uh, and, and, and the key here is that this projection itself is actually a optimization problem that we can differentiate through now using these techniques I talked about. Um, okay, let's give a few more here. I'm actually skip a couple because I, uh, want to get to my last thoughts before before the end of the of the hour here. Um, I'll highlight two more uh, applications of these things. So one application is what's and what's something we call inverse optimal power flow. So in in power networks, which is a domain I work in a lot, um, it's very common to want to try to uh, solve what's called optimal power flow, which is to say, um, given uh, a network all the bids of generators um, and, and the, the demand of customers, how do I dispatch power from these generators to minimize say, the cost of generation? Right? And there's a lot of things that we want that, that you know, and, and the you know, system operators right now solve these things you know, many times, uh, maybe every, every, every few minutes actually, in order to figure out what generators turn on and off. Um, but this, the, the, the data for these problems is very, um, it's very sensitive, right? Because, you know, you don't want to publish data about how much generators cost all in the whole grid because there's this competitive advantage that others can get and they can game the system. And so there's data that's actually private for a good reason, like bids are, are, are private for a very good reason. Otherwise, there's just the potential for, for people to kind of manipulate the system. Um, however, there's also things that are not private, like the cost associated with generation and stuff like this to the end user. And, and uh, sort of without getting into too much details here, 
What we show is that by actually sort of looking at these um, optimization, uh, sort of these, these, these optimal power flow um, solvers, there are cases where we can actually recover these private data like generator costs or things like the network grid structure, which I'm also might not want to inform people about just from the data that's made publicly available by these, by these, um, uh, you know, as, as a result of these solutions. So oftentimes things like, you know, generator bidding curves or the grid structure is unknown, but you can actually infer it from things like generator uh, production and locational prices by, by essentially differentiating through this optimization problem until you find uh, generation, you know, bidding curves and grid structure that actually matches the output you see. This, this process can work surprisingly well sometimes to kind of invert the solution to, to OPF problems. And finally, um, I want to highlight that, that, uh, that you know, um, th there's a lot of problems here that, and I, I highlight some that, you know, in, in things like climate sustainability that are uh, inherently discrete, right? So, um, you know, I've talked about things like, you um, you know, phys physics and, and, and things like this, which are inherently continuous, but there are a lot of problems that are much more discrete in nature. So even actually the example of, of optimal power flow, uh, in reality, you have not just uh, continuous optimization variables there, but you also have binary ones for things like, will, will the generator be on or off and things like this. Um, but what we showed in some additional work is that even for some, and, and, and you know, this, of course, discrete problems are, are everywhere, right? There's a lot of problems that are, that are not by their nature um, continuous, but by their nature discrete. And discrete problems, you know, inherently seem non-differentiable, right? Because you can change them a little bit and the outcome being discrete will not change. So by definition, the derivatives there are zero. Um, and so therefore you can't at least naively often differentiate through these things in the same way we just talked about before. However, it turns out that in some other work, which appeared um, a couple of years ago at, at ICML, um, we actually can show that you can differentiate through smoothed approximations of these problems. And one very useful smooth approximation of these problems is called a, 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 is called a semi-definite programming relaxation of these problems. Semi-definite programming itself is, 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 is a very big topic in, in complex optimization. But basically, what the, the, the high level here is that um, there are a lot of uh, continuous relaxations for discrete optimization problems that involve semi-definite variables and optimizing over semi-definite matrices. And you can do this relaxation to get a smooth variant of your discrete problem. And oftentimes these are very good for exactly this process of differentiating through. So one sort of fun, uh, and, we, and we actually did this in a, in a, in a, um, a paper called the, um, the SATNET paper which basically differentiates through a max sat, which is the optimization variant of a satisfiability problem. And we, and we which is of course a discrete problem. Um, and we showed that by differentiating through this, this some infinite relaxation, we're able to sort of solve some very um, discrete in nature problems. Uh, one of these actually being, um, we taught a, a, a network that used that has one of these things to solve Sudoku problems just from examples. So rather than telling it kind of the rules of Sudoku and having it solve it with constraint satisfaction, which is very easy to do, uh, if you just give the you know a, a learning algorithm a bunch of examples of unsolved and solved Sudoku puzzles um, with very little data, if you if you use these techniques to can actually teach the network just from examples kind of how to solve Sudoku, even if you also have things like, you know, visual images that represent the Sudoku board instead of the actual, um, instead of the actual numbers themselves, because of course deep learning is very good at sort of images. So this is sort of a fun, a fun little demo of, of, of showing basically how to incorporate, you know, digit classification and Sudoku together in, 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 in one network. Okay, so this is actually all I want to say about uh, applications. I just want to end with some final thoughts here. Um, so I'll start off with maybe maybe a you know maybe a bold claim, but hopefully not that bold. I think people probably mostly agree with this uh, you know in this community here, which is that as much as you know I think there's there's an interest a huge interest in, in using techniques in machine learning for scientific applications and similarly you know um, finding ways to inject science structure of scientific domains within machine learning methods. Um, there's typically been, and again, there's of course many exceptions to this, but you know, uh, speaking in very broad strokes here, there has been somewhat of a disconnect between these two communities in that um, the methodology that machine learning uses is almost entirely based upon these sort of unconstrained um, black box kind of generic models that can kind of fit any function. 
And one of the key constraints of the scientific community is that we actually want to incorporate structure and constraints into our models. And in fact, sometimes that's actually what we care about most is finding that structure. And so while there's many ways to sort of start to bridge these gaps, and I think, you know, people, including many people in this, in this uh, workshop have sort of done a lot of that work. Um, what I would sort of advocate for, and what, what I sort of hopefully want to sort of emphasize through this, through this talk is that the, there's a lot of situations in which the tools and techniques that the scientific community develops, that is, you know, um, solvers for physical systems, optimization solvers, systems like this, they don't need to just be kind of bolted on to machine learning approaches, right? So you don't need to just sort of, you know, try to throw a machine learning algorithm somewhere in the loop there that's itself a black box that just sort of, um, you know, makes predictions and just trains in a normal kind of predictive fashion. Um, what's actually the case is that these two settings can actually be tightly integrated. And so you can actually integrate the constraints of physical systems directly within machine learning methods. And similarly, you could optimize machine learning methods to actually optimize, you know, larger uh, objectives than just sort of predictive accuracy of machine learning systems. And of course, there's many other ways to do this, but this notion of implicit layers is one very pow powerful paradigm for how we go about doing this. Um, and as a sort of a final thought, I think, you know, this is, this is a very sort of powerful paradigm, but it's just sort of the start in a lot of ways, right? Because there are a lot of processes which are even more complex than anything I've described here. Sometimes they're unknown, they can't be fully described. And we want, we still want ways to integrate these things uh, or integrate machine learning within sort of, uh, you know, policy making or economics or development and all this kind of stuff, right? Um, and the question that I sort of have, uh, maybe even broader than what I've talked about here is, are there ways to integrate machine learning into these processes as well? And what will be the ultimate benefits of machine learning kind of in, in, in these settings and beyond? Um, so all my, uh, you know, all the work I've talked about here is available on my website. As I said, there's also this implicit layers tutorial. Maybe I should go back to that one for a second here. I would uh, also, you know, advertise this site here more as well. And um, with that, I'll say thank you very much. Thanks for staying a few minutes over and uh, happy to take any questions now. Thanks a lot for your talk. Um, whilst we wait for a question, I have one question. Absolutely. So when you, like, for example, neural ODEs, you have like the adjoint method and then yes. in the forward path, you solve, uh, you do a PDA solve. In yep. the backward path, you're using the same code to do another PDE solve, but like, just like backwards, right? Yeah. For like the, if you have like, for example, a quadratic program, do you yep. solve in the backward path also a quadratic program? Uh, it's actually simpler in that case. It is actually a, because it's actually a linear solve. So for any for any algebraic equation, the backward pass actually is going to be a linear solve here. So it's a little different for an ODE because you, you you do get a differential equation. Um, there's something actually sim similar where you you can actually you know in some cases you, you get a linear. Uh, so like in a PDE, you often get a linear P, uh, PDE in the backward pass, even if it's a nonlinear PDE in the forward pass. Um, but uh, in general, for an algebraic set of equations, the backward pass is always just a linear solve. Now, it has a lot of the same structure as the forward pass. And actually, you know, a quadratic program with, say, just equality constraints is also actually a linear solve. So you can actually, you can still solve it, say, with a quadratic programming solver if you want to. Um, and sometimes due to the sparsity or other things, it might be better to do that way. But actually, there's a really nice property here, which is that the backward pass really is on some, some fundamental level um, because you, know, you, you just continue a local gradient, right? And, and uh, you know, gradients are by themselves sort of linear in nature. Um, it's always going to be linear. And so this system, this is a general condition here that, that holds. And no matter what the forward sort of equation is, this backward pass will involve the solution of a linear equation. This is just this, this for any given solution is a matrix. And this is a matrix here. So you're just doing a linear solve. And that's actually a very nice property of these things. Mm -hmm. So there are two questions in the thing. Do you want to read them yourself? Yeah. So so um, so uh, okay. Actually, there's a few. <laughs> uh, there's uh, let, me, let, me, let me start from the beginning. Okay. So um, are the considerations to choose the location of implicit layers within the network? Does the location of implicit layer have a significant impact on the performance? Yeah. So I will I will actually admit one thing here that almost entirely we use implicit layers either as the last layer or the sole layer in a deep network. I mean, not, not quite. Sometimes we have a little bit of post-processing in some of our and some of our other sort of um, other networks. But for the most part, um, I typically think about implicit layers like self-optimization problem 
as kind of like a post-processing step to the typical output of a deep network. So it's a very intuitive thing, right? You take the output, you project it or manipulate it in some way to produce some new output, and then you have this sort of end-to-end -end architecture that produces outputs that obey certain constraints, right? So this is a very nice sort of way to think about it. And I, I think maybe I'm just not creative enough yet to, or, or ever <laughs> maybe, to, to think about what it would mean to have constraints kind of at more intermediate nodes and what the advantage of that would be. I think there are advantages. And actually there are a few cases where we do this. So for example, in the case of that SatNet program, where you have this like logical approximation, like a logical satisfiability solve, we've used that in a case like a recurrent network to solve things like parity functions or like to predict things like parity functions. So there are examples where we have them kind of in the, in the middle, but the vast majority of cases here, we're talking about kind of a final tuning or a final projection. And that's by far the most common thing. Or maybe a pre-processing step too would be another one, right? Where you want to project your input to sort of have some properties always. But I think a big question that remains is, what are the right ways of sort of incorporating these things maybe in a slightly more generic fashion into different or any layer of a network? Um, now, one thing I should also add, by the way, though, is that a lot of existing components of deep networks can also be formulated as optimization problems. They're just less common to do that way. So most activations, for example, like the ReLU, the ReLU, which you clip negative example and uh, uh, negative components, the ReLU is a projection onto the positive ortho. So in some sense, I mean, it's, it's, it's sort of a trivial one, right? But you can think of the ReLU itself as solving an optimization problem. It's projecting the initial point onto the points that are uh, the set of all positive uh, examples. And so there are a lot of cases like this where you can kind of make the argument that maybe things are solving implicit, implicit layers, but um, the, the, the real use of sort of a general purpose implicit layer, like an optimization solver inside, you know, in the, in the intermediate layers of a network is still kind of unclear. Okay, so one, um, oh, and there's also, does, does it have a significant impact on the, oh, okay, I, th I think, so, so one thing also, which I mentioned before, um, uh, in terms of performance, uh, they are much slower typically. And so actually a, an ongoing question would be great because you're, you're solving an optimization problem every time you do a forward pass. Uh, and so we've done a lot of work in sort of making these more efficient, making them more parallelizable, like most deep learning is, because you typically do deep learning on you know, batches of data. But really, um, I think a, a big a question is sort of how you make these things efficient. And we have some work ongoing in that area, but it's still, still an open problem. Uh, Brenda uh, writes, can you talk about combining Bayesian neural layers with other stochastic equations? Ah, boy, I can't talk. I don't think I can talk actually uh, that substantively about this. So I, I, what I will say is that I think there's been some cool work on um, stochastic differential equation solvers within, within deep networks and differential through, through, through an SDE, uh, which, which sometimes are interpreted as kind of being a, a more Bayesian-like version of other layers people have. But really when you talk about sort of Bayesian neural, neural networks, which are, you know, uh, where you have some distribution over, over your parameters and you, and you, you know, compute your posterior given your, your samples. I, 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 we haven't done a lot of work kind of tightly integrating those two things, um, but it will be an interesting area to think about. Um, so uh, Leonardo writes, I was wondering about the generalization of the whole framework. Um, uh, I can see that the framework is working better on problems which you are learning, but what about new problems? Yeah, so I, I mean, I, I think this in some sense, this is sort of a, 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 good, a good question. So, so to a certain extent, what we are doing in all of this, right, is we are embedding structure into networks to trade off um, sort of uh, training complexity uh, or rather maybe, maybe, you know, sample complexity for, uh, of, 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 the, of the network. So, you know, we might need less data at the cost of being a little bit more complex, right? Because we're, in, and being a little more specialized because we are specific to a certain, a certain type of domain, right? So if you are simulating physics and you actually are trying to model something that is physical, that's great. It's going to speed up learning. It's going to do a better job of generalizing to new scenarios um, without having a ton of data that has to cover kind of the whole span of everything you could observe. But um, it comes at the cost of being more specialized, right? So what we're really talking about here is we're talking about embedding, you know, prior structure into deep networks in a way that can make them generalize better with less data, um, but which does make them more specialized, right? Which does sort of decrease their ultimate representational power. And, and finding the right position for this trade-off, I think, is a big open question. But personally, I think that, you know, successful deep learning and successful machine learning 
almost always involves some trade-off between generality and uh, specialization to the problem of interest. And this is one very nice way of sort of integrating prior structure in a way that, that sort of meshes well with modern deep learning. Uh, I got a question, can I show the talk slides? Yes, I guess I can, I'm happy to. Uh, Henning, maybe I'm, I'll, I'll send them to you after, I'm, after I log off here and you're welcome to put them uh, where, wherever. Um, that's great. Um, uh, so, so yeah, so, so do you jump up with layers to, to, um, to stiff integrators in, in neural ODEs, I think was maybe the question. Uh, yeah, so again, this is kind of one of the benefits of, of, of implicit layers, right? Is that, is that the forward pass can be whatever you want, right? So if you have, if, if, if the other equation here is a differential equation that happens to, to, to be stiff, there's been a whole ton of work on solving stiff differential equations, right? And so you can just use those solvers sort of off the shelf, apply them here, and then and I guess in this case, it would be actually a, a you probably you know, upon the same thing because the because the backward, the adjoint is going to be kind of stiff as well. Um, but you can then apply the same thing kind of to the backward pass as well. Uh, and so I think that that to a certain extent, I mean, and actually to be clear, the, the, the neural ODE stuff is actually more uh, a, a, a different group. Actually, one of my co-collaborators on, on the implicit tutorials is, is David Divina, who is the you know, one of the um, developers or one, or, or one of the, 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 the original authors of the, or the senior author of the neural ODE paper. Uh, they've done a lot more work in kind of applying things like stiff solver, like you know, state-of-the-art solvers for ODEs, incorporating those within deep networks. And, um, and I think that, that you know, that's sort of um, kind of much more his, his ballpark than mine, but there has been definitely some work on kind of you know, using modern solvers to in, in integrating those with, with deep networks. Um, yes, so, so uh, it doesn't make the neural network exactly conservative. Yes, exactly. So, so um, that one actually is, is uh, so, so in conservative, okay, so, so Andrea asks, an implicit layer could be used to make the field treated by a neural network exactly conservative. This could be useful in ML for physics. So there's actually, there's actually, uh, this, this is a really interesting um, thing here. So, so um, there's two ways you can make a, uh, a, a sort of the output of function conservative. Um, one way is to, as actually to say, as sorry, exactly as you say, you sort of um, take whatever it predicts and project it onto the set of sort of, you know, energy conserving curves in some sense, right? Which is exactly right. You can do that. We actually have a paper at two years ago at NeurIPS on learning dynamical systems that are guaranteed to be stable by kind of this exact method. So you basically take a, a function you're trying to model and you project the output of that function onto a Lyapunov function that requires the system actually converge to a uh, be globally stable. Um, there's also some work at that same neurops actually uh, on Hamiltonian neural networks, which are something very similar, which sort of by the, by the set of the nature, the, by the set of the network um, require that the system, you know, have essentially a Hamiltonian, which is energy conserving. And so you sort of get that um, also from the network. But what I'll also say is that the conservation sort of a, is sort of a, a cool one because you can actually do it sort of without implicit layers in some sense. So you can also guarantee the system is, cons uh, is, is, is sort of energy conserving by, uh, say if you have some like gradient field, right? You can make it energy conserving as long as that gradient field is the, um, is sort of the vector, is, is, the, is the derivative of some vector potential, the system will also be energy conserving. And so um, basically has to have curl zero, I think, right? This, I, I, I get these all confused, the definitions. I don't, I, I don't work that much in these, in these areas, but, but um, you can actually get the same thing um, oftentimes by just requiring the network itself be the derivative of a scalar valued energy function essentially. And, and uh, you can do that actually directly with, with uh, IMAC differentiation too. So, so you can do it in a few different ways, but there's a lot of cool ways you can kind of enforce that sort of, uh, sort of structure. Okay, um, uh, often you are enforcing physical laws that only, approx only approximations of nature, yeah. And so do you need to satisfy, exactly satisfy the implicit layer equations in the learned model? Yeah, so, so I think there's two, there's, there's two sort of points there. So first of all, yes, you know, um, definitely real physics, right? It's not governed by rigid body dynamics with LTPs, right? And, and Coulomb approximations of friction and stuff like that. Um, and so, so all these things are approximations. And um, the degree to which they're going to sort of work, because the networks are restricted to live on this subspace of sort of like, you know, the, the, the manifold, 
that predicted by the simulations, you're never gonna, unless you have some sort of other unit bolted on that can predict like things like residuals, you're never gonna really learn beyond the physics in some sense. And it's a deeper insight or deeper sort of more accurate simulation of the true laws of nature. Um, that's sort of one part and that definitely is true. The second part I think is actually a different, a little different question, which is, you know, how much, which is maybe not what you were asking, but maybe something I should have mentioned too, which is to say, how well do we really have to solve this thing here? Uh, in order for these things to work, right? Because this, this equation actually uh, is only true if I find a Y that exactly solves this, this system. And in practice, I can't often do that. I can find some sort of approximate solution. Now, fortunately, there are smoothness properties here. So as long as you get something that's, that's relatively close to the solution here, you will find something, and, and, and you know, this matrix here is not singular and stuff like that, which you can also guarantee in certain situations. But in those cases, you are guaranteed there's going to be some smoothness here. So if I get a good enough solution to the, the this system here, I will have an approximate derivative. And um, however, I will actually say that the, the, the reality is the situation is a little bit better than that, because the reality is that in a lot of deep learning, we're ultimately doing stochastic gradient descent anyway, right? We're, we're, we're approximating the gradients uh, based upon other components of data. And so if these gradients are a bit wrong, uh, everything still kind of works okay, at least up to a point. And so, um, but what is not understood, frankly, just generally we don't understand is how wrong, you know, how approximate can we be in our forward pass in order to be sort of meaningful in our learning component? That, 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 that still is, is definitely not understood. It's very much a sort of a heuristic, uh, arguments we use there, and very much an area of open of open work. All right, and then now someone says now there there's more and more development on neural ODs, etc. If you put them in some taxonomy, what will it look like? Are they all the same? All functions, some explicit neural network layers, and explicit. So I I would put the taxonomy as the following. I was and, and, and you know I think in that implicit layer tutorial we um, tried to have a tax somewhat of a taxonomy at least. And sort of the basic taxonomy we have is that you know there's, a, there's implicit layers, period, uh, and then within implicit layers there are several subtypes like um, neural ODEs, like another class that we've worked on a lot called called um, equilibrium models. There's another class, and then, and then there are other classes like differentiable optimization, differentiable simulation. Um, so I would put them all under the category of implicit layers. The the crux of an implicit layer is that the layer itself does not is not specified by how you compute the output. It is specified by the conditions the output satisfies. Maybe I should have said that more succinctly in the talk itself, because that's that's the real condition here, right? And so neural ODEs, just like you know, optimization, they are specified by conditions the output should satisfy. Now, how well the output actually satisfies those things depends, of course, on your implementation, on how you solve it, on you know how many iterations you use, et cetera. But the crux of an implicit layer is that, and, and this is what an implicit function really is, right? Is that you'd specify in your, in your code, not how to compute the output, but what the output should, should do. And this is a really actually important kind of separation and uh, sort of modularity that's been very, very effective in other fields. So optimization being one example, right? It's very useful in optimization um, to specify your optimization problem separate from how you specify the solver for it, right? This is a, this, this is a, this is a sort of a um, level of abstraction that's proved very, very useful there. And in some sense, the goal of implicit layers in machine learning is to impose this exact same abstraction at the concept, at the unit of a layer, of a differentiable layer in, in machine learning systems. Okay, I think those were all questions. I think, uh, yeah, I think we've reached the end of the, of the queue at least. I've caught up, at least we'll say. Yeah. <laughs> Don't know if it's yeah. ever all the questions, but, um, but yeah, it's-, it's, yeah. it's, it's uh, Thanks a lot for coming, for coming, or like for, for, for presenting. Yeah, um, thanks very much for having me. This has been a lot of fun. Um, and uh, I'll remind, send me an email follow-up to remind me some new slides and I'll, I'll do it, I'll do it in a couple of minutes, but uh, I might, I might uh, grab a, you know, grab some coffee first, something like that, but then I'll, I'll send them soon. Today, so I don't forget. Otherwise, I will, you know, yeah. <laughs> if it goes till till the weekend, it'll never happen. So uh, <laughs> yeah, it's great to it's great to uh, great to be here. And thanks very much for the for the invitation. Uh, had a great time. Yeah. Okay. Thanks a lot. Um, for whoever is interested, we will be back in two weeks with Tamara Kolder from Sandia National Labs, and uh, hope to see everyone then.